All right, so we're gonna be talking about the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, and everybody's heard this term uh, through the media. Um, and whenever I lecture, I do have to give my disclaimers, disclosures, uh, conflicts of interest, that's true for everybody. Uh, these are some of the people I work with and some of the organizations I work for. These are some of my kids that I work for to try to uh, take care of my kids and uh, support them. And these are some of the books that I've written. So whenever I speak, I do have to talk about the potential conflicts of interest, which means that some of the AMA Guides books, if you buy them, I get royalties because I'm one of the editors. Uh, so I'm just sh disclosing that to you. Uh, trust me, uh, on these books, the AMA uh, gets the vast majority of the money. M me and my co-editors figure we get less than a, a dollar a book. So I'm definitely keeping my day job. This is not something that you know is going to support me forever. There's the guides to causation. Work ability and return to work becomes very important, especially when we're talking about the long COVID, which we'll get to. Um, the guide sixth edition, uh, yes, we are fifth edition state, but you can cite any medical reference uh, to justify an opinion. So if it happens to come from the sixth edition, it's like any other textbook, which can be used. Um, sorry, a couple more people. Um, next, uh, if somebody's new, to the fields of short-term disability, long-term disability, uh, workers' compensation, risk, capacity, tolerance, the work workability topic, causation topics. This is a book that's a, a smaller one we put together. It's very helpful for people if you have staff uh, or uh, new attorneys trying to uh, understand a field. This could be very helpful for you. Okay. Um, and uh, next, references. Uh, so just keep this in mind. A number of my points are going to be in the articles that I've published. Uh, in the literature, right? So first of all, the uh, the uh, uh, ACOM guidelines. So this is ACOM. You can see right here, you see it at mdguidelines.com and it's free. You don't have to be a member uh, to be able to get access to it. And this has a summary of all the medical literature that we've put together on coronavirus and some of the things I'm gonna be talking about. By the way, if you look at the guideline, the national guideline, don't get blown away because it is 150 pages. But but before you before you're ready to shoot me, just keep in mind, that the majority of the information is in the first part of the handout and the, the rest is supporting documentation tables. So it's not quite as bad as it might look at first. You may still think it's bad, but it's not quite as bad as you think it's gonna look. Okay, um, also uh, available is uh, some of the articles we've published on rating survivors of COVID-19. Uh, that's an annual view. That's also in um, uh, the AMA guides. This is also in um, uh, the Journal of Occupational Environmental Medicine. Um, and so that's where you can find a lot of these different articles. So if you just do a search like here for the JOE article, evaluating COVID-19 injury claims, so that can be very helpful for you when you're trying to justify and understand your opinions about medical information. And so you just Google my name or something like that. And if you can't remember that, just go to my website, which is hymenhealth.com. I usually keep a, a copy of all my um, all my stuff on there. And so that, that could be helpful for you also, okay? Um, next. Virology. Here we go. Um, so when we talk about SARS-CoV-2, we're talking about a beta coronavirus, and it comes from bat coronaviruses. Now, this is the largest RNA virus. So you've heard about those vaccines, right? The mRNA viruses. So this is the same one uh, that uh, that is uh, geared towards the RNA of that. Now, by the way, look at that. Look, look, look at this. Look at this. 10 to 30 percent of the common colds are due to coronavirus. Statistically speaking, you have already been exposed to the coronavirus at some point in your life because statistically speaking, you've already had a common cold. By the way, that's why we say, Mark, I don't understand. Why is it that some people, when they get the coronavirus, are not so bad? And other people, when they get the coronavirus, they have a lot of trouble, right? So one of the issues could be is that you're going to be able to see that on these people, they may have had the common colds before, and they may have some antibodies towards those other components. And so when they get exposed to the coronavirus, uh, they've already kind of seen it before, and that's one of the reasons why they may be having a lighter reaction, right? Called corona because it looks like the sun under a microscope, and then there's what the term stand for SARS. Now, there's a re relative of this, MERS. We're going to be talking about this because this is a very similar related cousin to SARS. And this comes up where you're trying to take a look at uh, how we evaluate this, okay? So uh, what's the history here, right? So questionably, it jumped from horseshoe bats. So this is the stuff that gets in the literature about what happened, where did it happen, how did it happen, stuff. I don't know if we're ever going to get a straight answer on that stuff. 
because you know part of it comes uh, out of China, which you know sometimes it, there's not as uh, an open dialogue there. Um, you, they always talk about the wet market, but probably not related to the wet market. And um, and there is some more recent literature that maybe it was more of an engineered virus, but you know who knows? You're never going to be able to get to the bottom of this kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, and then why bats? Because bats live for 25 years in large groups, right? Because they live in large groups, they tend to get infections that spread around. So they're gonna have more and more mutations in those uh, bats. And bats are mammals, right? So now you start seeing, okay, hey, these are similar animals to us. They live a long time, they live in large groups. So now you can see why those viruses go circulating around, right? By the way, there was a lot of research papers that said that there was gonna be a pandemic. Those papers as, as recently as 2015, 2016, were saying, look, just the odds are that some virus is gonna break through and cause trouble for us, right? So this is not to be uh, unexpected, right? The SARS came before, look, look at this, look. We had the first outbreak in 2003, 2004. Now that lasted only nine months. There's about 8,000 infections. Look at that mortality rate, okay, 10%. I want you to keep these numbers in mind. This is very important. Look at those numbers, right? SARS, MERS, the closely related cousin. Look at the mortality rates for those things, right? Which is why when you see those large mortality rates, you're going to compare it to the current infection. You're going to see a big difference, which is why when you look at these past ones, you see that they didn't last very long, right? Keep that in mind. All right. Is reinfection possible? Everybody talks about the virology. Is reinfection possible? Yes. Um, but generally, there's been no human reinfection with the same virus. Yes. There have been some of these variants you've heard about, some of these mutations, right? Well, a couple things. One, mind you, influenza mutates about 50 times a year, corona about 25 times a year. That's why, by the way, we give a flu shot every year because the flu shifts around a lot. Corona doesn't shift as much. So when you start hearing about this stuff, oh my God, I heard about Belgium, Nevada, Hong Kong, South Africa, the UK, all kinds of stuff. Okay, look, look, look. Anything is possible, right? So it's true that they have some variation, but the majority of the virus is the same. It's true that some of these new strains might be more virulent, meaning they're more easily able to jump from person to person. But it's not necessarily so that they're more lethal. As a matter of fact, it can go both ways. Mutations happen all the time, and a lot of them are benign. By the way, I showed you that the common cold due to coronavirus, right, has those um, uh, uh, experience of 10 to 30 percent causing the common cold. Those are not severe. People don't have bad problems with that. So you can start to see why it's going to be the kind of scenario where you don't necessarily have a big problem with it. It may not be causing more difficulties for you, right? Okay, next. This is what the coronavirus looks like. That's a model of it. Let's take another look though. Look, 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 look at this, look at this. S protein, that's the spike protein. That's the one that all but one, all but one of the vaccines is geared towards that spike protein, right? The M protein, the matrix protein, that there's one a vaccine that's geared towards that, but spike protein, the most specific and also the strongest at attaching, right? So that's the one that we're focusing the efforts on with the vaccines. Okay, now we go to rest stop. Okay, this is social distancing, uh, then and now. So we've talked about virology. I want to talk to you about epidemiology, okay? Here we go. Stay with me, right? Primarily spread by respiratory droplets from cough. Okay, now listen, this is very important, okay? A respiratory droplet usually only travels two to three feet. That's why, by the way, the World Health Organization said all the social distancing you need is about a meter. That's why the American Academy of Pediatrics said in, in schools, eh, if you get the kids a meter apart from each other, it's more than enough, right? So the six distance, the six foot distance thing is like, you know, extra, extra or whatever like that, uh, but probably not necessary. Also, when they talk about droplets, we're talking about large, wet, heavy things, right? Those are the ones that carry most of the virus. Those are the ones that drop to the ground quickly, right? Which is why it's not true 
that it's going to be something that exists in the air forever. When they say that, they're talking about aerosols. Okay, so look, 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 aerosol. There are different sizes, right? So we talked about the droplet, right? That's the large one, greater than 100 microns, right? Thoracic, smaller, and the respirals, those are the really small ones, the one they call aerosols. They also call them droplet nuclei. You may hear these terms, right? And an aerosol, yes, it can last in a room. We see that in medical procedures, right? Where you have these ongoing pieces of equipment generating aerosols. But in general, this is not going to be an issue. Yes, it's true. There was a story, uh, research about Skag Acquire. Okay, so it's up to the state of Washington. You had all these people in a small room standing shoulder to shoulder, singing their lungs out. Okay, right? If you're going to give me that scenario, then yes, aerosolization with small little respiratory droplets happens, right? But the only scenario that you can give me that's going to be something that's a problem is when you go to a very small room, lots of people, closed ventilation, right? And there's even criteria for how you notice ventilation room, right? Less than three liters per second, right? It is a worrisome thing. Ideal is eight to 10 liters per second, right? There's ways of doing this, right? There was aerosolization in some tall buildings in China, right? And in those tall buildings happen to be that the, the way they do their flushing systems and their, and their valves and their toilets and stuff led to all this trouble, right? So is it possible that some little fine mist somewhere could tr cause trouble? Look, anything is possible. Let's talk about medical reality. The reality is these goes by large droplets. It's much more rare to be in those small aerosols, it's much more rare, right? You're just not gonna get enough of it, right? Let me give you an example. Look at this, aerosol for measles. Aerosol for measles has an attack rate of 85, 9%. Anybody ever hear when they used to do chicken box parties or measles parties, right? What was that? That was where it does travel by aerosol. That's where you don't really see much, don't really see maybe a little bit of coffee stuff, but that's where it's gonna happen, Corona. In healthcare workers, people are exposed in the hospital. Maybe you get aerosolization 10%, maybe, right? And in the households, you maybe get a 10 if you want to be generous. Okay, I'll give it to you 40% of the time in one study, right? But that's extremely rare. And you got to think about this. These are people living next to each other, right? That are having this uh, situation. So it's extremely rare to be anything like that. It's the respiratory droplets, and that's the big thing. Okay, next, next. Very important epidemiologist. Look, 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 look at this. There is no transmission. If the infected person was sick for at least six days, maximum 10 days, and it's rare if only if it's severe 14 days, okay? So remember these numbers. Remember these numbers, right? When they start talking about who we're exposed to, when we're exposed, if you're looking at a claim, if you're trying to figure out, oh, I just got a call from my kid's school, or, you know, oh, my wife just said this or something, you look at those numbers, keep those numbers in mind, right? Because if somebody gets sick, right? Yes, they'll be transmitting virus initially, but it drops off very quickly, okay? And that's something I want you to keep in mind, right? Let's take a look at how some of this looks, right? So here we talked about those droplets, right? So look here, right? When you have the large droplets, the ones that carry most of the virus, right? Those large droplets, they fall to the floor in three to five seconds. That's it, right? So it's gone. It's down on the floor in three to five seconds, right? That's the ones that carries most of the virus because those are the large, wet droplets, right? Those are the ones that are going to carry the virus, right? About 90% of the virus is gone at six minutes in sun exposure, right? Which is why. I tell all my patients, get outside. I can't, I can't begin to tell you what will light me up when we start talking about these people that closed beaches and closed parks. It is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in medicine, right? It's the opposite. You want people outside. You want them outside for multiple reasons. One, because they're going to be more likely to exercise. Two, they're going to see sunlight and have better circadian rhythm. Three, they're going to be with the sun exposure and they're going to kill off the virus anyways. Four, they're not going to get depressed for being locked inside all the time, right? It is nonsense. And this, this stuff about, oh, everybody, no matter where you go, walking outside, you have to wear a mask. It's just not true, right? It's just not true because look at the data, look at the science, and you'll see why this stuff is not true, right? So yes, can there be anything else? Anything is possible, right? But there's no study that's ever, ever being able to culture these live viruses from the magical, mystical air, right? Uh, and, and that's always been shown. By the way, there's ways to study this. Look at this, look at this. This is the original Gesundheit chamber. 
Okay, this is from a study in 1966 in Fort Dedrick. They're looking how people cough and sneeze and how things travel, right? Here's another one. The short range droplets imaging from a 1942 Genesis experiment, right? Where they show what these distances are, right? And then there's this one that ended up in the newspaper, right? This long range video saying, okay, look at this cloud. This cloud uh, uh, went uh, 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 up to seven, eight meters, right? Okay, look, if you want to give me, you know, we're in the Super Bowl time. You want to give me one of the Super Bowl players that's the size of a house and he leans back and coughs and sneezes, you know, and can project, okay, anything's possible, okay? But let's just talk about reality, okay? Look at these droplets, the ones that have most of us. See, they're dropping off right here. They're dropping off, right? You can get these little mists. But these things are not going to cause trouble unless you say to me, Mark, I'm going to a room with 100 people and it's 10 by 10 and there's no windows. Okay, then anything's possible, right? But if you want to talk about reality, this is not going to happen, right? Right, next. Incubation period. Look at these numbers. Please keep these numbers in mind, right? How long does it take after you're exposed for the virus to incubate? About four to six days. Rarely can it get up to 10 to 14 days, right? Now look at this next number. Please, please, please look, 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 look. Not over 97% of patients are nasopharyngeal positive by nine days, which means, which means if you're exposed to somebody and you want to know, well, did I get it or not, right? If you wait until about eight days or nine days and go get your nasal smear and it's negative, you're essentially done, right? And so that's why you can uh, look at those numbers and kind of think about, okay, well, why are they saying, you know, isolation periods and quarantine periods and all that kind of stuff? Part of that comes from that, but part of it is just margins of safety, right? Um, okay, next, uh, viral shedding. Viral shedding occurs 24 hours before symptoms. And by the way, by the way, folks, folks, this is very important. I want you to keep this in mind, right? Everybody said, people always come in and say, oh, you know, you know Mark, I'm, I'm sick and I'm worried about my kids, one. Don't worry about your kids. Your kids are almost certainly the source of your sickness. Two, um, when you get a virus, right, you are usually most infectious before you have symptoms. That's just the way viruses work. They're not dumb. They figure, okay, I tell you what, we're starting to replicate here. Let's get out of here before the guy figures out he's sick and he doesn't let us uh, you know, go on to the, you know, infect somebody else, right? So you're most infectious 24 to 48 hours before symptom onset. And in mild cases, mild cases, you could probably shed virus for seven to 12 days. In severe cases, you may be able to shed virus for 20 days. But, but, this is the but. Please keep this in mind. You can have virus coming out of you, but after about six days, you're not going to infect anybody. You're going, well, how's that possible? I'll tell you how that's possible. Because as you get better, the amount of virus coming out of you gets less and less. As you get better, the viral particles that are coming out are not all healthy viral particles. As you get better, you're not sneezing and coughing as much, right? And so that's why you don't have to worry. That's why, for example, that's why I have this here. You can shed virus for weeks, right? I've had patients and, and people say to me, oh, well, I got this guy. Oh, oh hold on, where do we go here? Uh, I got this guy that went and got tested, right? This person went and got tested two weeks later and they still had the virus. I don't care. So what? It doesn't matter, right? You can have virus for weeks and weeks and weeks after you're better, right? They're not going to cause infection. They're not going to transmit. There's not enough of them. You're not emitting them enough, right? Um, the majority of people, by the way, will have no or mild symptoms. Look at this number. About 70, 80% of people will have no or mild symptoms, right? I'm not saying it's not a big deal. I'm not saying it doesn't hurt people. I'm not saying it doesn't make you sick. I'm not saying that people haven't died. What I'm saying is that's the data. The vast majority of people. So when people say, that's it, my life is over, I can't go out. Do you know how many patients I've had to put on uh, SSRIs this year because they're sitting at home, isolated, miserable, because they, they were convinced that if they get one sniffle, the life is over, right? It's not even close to reality, okay? I want to give you another thing, another thing. Look about this virus shedding and stuff. There, there's something that's very important, so stay with me, stay with me. You've heard about viral testing, right? So the virus can shed but not be infectious, right? So sometimes people get a report say, oh, my PCR was positive, right? Let me tell you something about PCRs, right? PCR de depends very much on what's called the threshold cycle count, okay? Which means 
that there's a way that the test is run that depending on how that test is run, it may be read as positive, but it's not an infectious positive, right? Nobody ever tells you that, right? But you need to know that. That's why I have patients that said, well, I went and got routinely tested because I want to check it came back positive, right? Well, of course it's going to come back positive, right? It's going to come back positive uh, because you just had a chance of some random false positive or you're going to have a chance of maybe showing something that's not there, right? Um, there is no difference in the level of virus between those who are asymptomatic and those who are severe, right? Everybody says, oh, that person was really sick, so their viral level is much higher. You know, it turns out it's not true. It turns out you could have somebody who has no symptoms and they could transmit the virus. You have other people very severe and they're not more likely to do that, right? Um, and by the way, by the way, one of the reasons we got this data is from the NBA. Remember last year they had the NBA in the bubble thing with all that stuff? Okay, so we could do studies on the NBA. And it turns out that uh, after about three days, they started having proliferation, right? So if you test everybody every day, you can start seeing it. Remember I told you the incubation period? About four to six days, right? So by about three days, they started to see a little bit of virus coming out, right? And then uh, six to 10 days was the clearance phase. So on these people, um, uh, they, they clear that infection, right? So that's why it's very important uh, uh, and very important that, that you keep that in mind, right? I'm not saying, you have to understand this very carefully. I'm not saying it's not a real disease. I'm not saying people have died. I'm not saying that it's not a problem. What I'm saying is, is that the vast majority of infections are mild. The vast majority of people do well. The vast majority uh, have an ability to clear this infection, right? The data are overwhelming that. Um, and so that's why I want you to keep that in mind, okay? Um, next, look at this. Here's another way to represent this, okay? You have the latency period and the incubation period, right? So this is where you get exposed and then you start having the virus replicating, it's incubating, and now you start being able to transmit the virus. Look, 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 see how you have people giving infection and transmitting before they have symptoms, right? So that's a kind of way to look at that in, in, a, in a graphical way to understand that, right? Okay, next on epidemiology, surfaces, right? Okay, first of all, you need to know the following things. When they say, okay, I, I see that they have this stuff and it can exist on these surfaces, I'm gonna wash my, um, uh, I'm gonna wash my, uh, uh, groceries and we'll wash the boxes and stuff like that. Okay, first of all, all the studies are done. When they did these in labs, they put viral loads on these lab particles that have never been replicated in the real world. What I mean by that is they took all these types of surfaces and they took huge viral loads, put them directly on the surface and said, how long do they last? Okay, but in the real world, in those large droplets, you're not going to get that kind of viral load, right? And one study on the half-life of a virus had one and a half to two and a half days with the virus at certain degrees and temperatures. But when you don't have light exposure, right, it makes a big difference. So a lot of packages are delivered. A lot of things are going in and out of a car, right? When you have light exposure, it also kills off viruses, okay? Um, next, you need to know when you hear these studies about, oh, there's a virus on here or something like that, what they're talking about are viral particles. It's not necessarily the whole virus. It's not necessarily ones that could cause infection. So here's another way to look at it. Look, look, look. Now, don't, not, stay with me on it. Stay with me on it. Okay, this is SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, right? The two SARS infections. And these are the different surfaces, copper, cardboard, steel, plastic, right? And you can see how quickly they drop off. By the way, notice that copper right? Notice how that's going to drop off very quickly, right? That comes up a lot of times in certain surfaces and things we talk about. But look at how quickly they drop off on those surfaces. There is no data whatsoever of any fomite transition. None. Zero, right? So all the boxes is, okay, now if you say, well, what, you know, what if, what if, okay, I guess anything is possible. If somebody has a box and they cough and sneeze all over the box in huge, heavy droplets. And within two minutes, they're at your doorstep. And then you go and pick it up with your bare hands and say, oh, I wonder what this is. And I'm going to wipe it over my face. Okay, I guess anything's possible, right? But short of that, let's talk about medical reality. In reality, 
There is no fomite transmission. And by the way, that's all through. The CDC has that everybody thing. Um, and so that's why it's important to keep that in mind, okay? When they talk about contagiousness, right? Um, uh, uh, contagiousness. This is called the R0, right? Which is the reproductive rate, right? And in general, this is 2.5, which means for every person infected, they'll give it to two to three people. By comparison, influenza is 1.3. So I, please keep the the very, very important, right? There's a difference between virulence and transmission and illness, right? So what does that mean? So that means that if something's more virulent, if something's more easily transmitted, the R0 is higher, right? Whereas if something doesn't jump as easily from person to person, then the R0 is lower. So when you have mitigation efforts, that R0 can get less than one. And that's when the spread will end, right? And there's even though you may have heard about herd immunity, there is a formula for that, right? And what's the true herd immunity? It depends on the studies. It depends on the illness. It could be anywhere from 15% up to 70%, right? And we're going to see exactly, um, uh, and then we can use them as, as a, a measure of how we're trying to think through this and make sure that you understand what's going on with that epidemiology, okay? Now, next, you have heard about predictions where they said, how many people are going to die? How many are going to see? Okay, look, there's multiple issues there. First of all, a lot of the stuff came from the uh, Ferguson's work at Imperial College. They were wrong before they're wrong again on this one, right? They were predicting millions. And the reason it didn't get to that number is because their models did not take into account personal factors, mitigation factors. Do you remember, anybody remember mad cow disease? These are the same people who told us that we were going to be slaughtering the entire herds of the United States, right? Never happened, right? If you're looking for some kind of reasonable kind of predictions for this forecast of the future, maybe the Reich Lab can help you with that to get an idea of what's reasonable um, and, and, uh, and, and a thought through process of how to predict these things. Let me just show the one to you. Just, just, just one, just an example, right? Look, 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 look at this graph, okay? I know it's busy. I just want to highlight to you how important it is to be always careful about looking at the literature, looking at the science, looking at the reports to understand things, right? Here's a graph, right? Then this has been replicated many times since then, okay? Um, uh, and then, uh, and so here is, um, here is a graph, right? So look here, look, 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 look. Do you see these are the infections over time, okay? And so what this study says, okay, look, you get to a place where you have a million uh, deaths per million at 21 days versus shutdown, right? And so what should happen is, is those people that shut down quickly, according to what Ferguson and Imperial College said, should have less infections. And those that shut down much later should have more infections, right? But it's not true. All these entities, all these countries, all these states, all had large infections on a per capita basis but they shut down quickly. All these people over here shut down late, but they didn't have huge amounts of infection over here. That's because the full economic shutdowns don't work. They have not worked. They will not work. What does work? Social distancing helps. Does masking help? We'll talk about a little bit. It helps a little bit, right? But again, not full economic shutdown. And you say, well, why is that? Why is it not helping, right? We, we've been shut down and the, the, you know, and the cases are going up, right? So if the cases are going up and you shut down, it should tell you it's not working. The second issue is why does it not work? I'll tell you why. Because what happens is, is when you tell people that's it, go home, don't go to work, you're sending people into their living environments, right? Where there's actually no protection being practiced. And two, most of the people that are the workers, that got shut down out of their jobs. Not the white color people, not like you and me can work remotely. These are people that are laborers. These are people working in the restaurants. These are, they go home. They go home to high density living. They go to home to crowded apartments, right? And so what happens is you're setting it up the opposite. You're setting it up uh, and, 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 um, uh, and that is the, the important thing about what you need to know about, okay? All right, next, uh, clinical features, right? After we do clinical features, we're going to get, be getting to some of the claim stuff, and then uh, and then we'll take the questions, okay? So just remember, this is some of the stuff you've heard about on the clinical features of who gets this. By the way, keep that in mind. About 80% of the deaths 
are the elderly, right? Median age is 80 years old. Okay, median age of this 80 years, about 40, 50% of the folks are the ones um, uh, that, uh, that you have to keep in mind are the source of the deaths. And then you've probably heard about this. So this is gonna be the kind of stuff that you need to know about, about the hypertension, obesity, the diabetes, those kind of things, right? What are the symptoms? These are some of this data from the literature about the different symptoms you may have heard about, right? About what the patients will be putting down their claims, what they will be talking about, what they'll be referencing when they said that they got exposed. You'll hear about some of the manifestations, some of the complications, right? So there are some neurologic complications that people talk about. This is summarized in one of these studies, right? In this study, about 13.5% of the people after two days after infection had some kind of neurologic or uh, clotting trouble, right? And this is a, just a schematic, just to show you what some of the patients could experience where they can get those clots in the circulation, okay? So how does those clinical features look, right? So you're gonna have the asymptomatics, right? Um, very unlikely to see asymptomatic in nursing homes, very likely to see it in prison population, right? And then you can have the mild infections, pre-symptomatic, those that have the mild upper respiratory, the low respiratory, and the worst one, the ARDS. And so it depends on the claim you're looking at, what kind of symptom reporting they're gonna be given to you, okay? And so when you have the uh, pneumonia, it's generally viral, and you don't treat those with antibiotics, right? The more worrisome ones is what's called the ARDS, where they get some problems deep into the lungs, right? Keep this in mind. Here's, here's a number very helpful for you. This usually hits about days four to seven, right? About days four to seven. So if somebody's going to generally get into the big trouble areas, right? The ones you're going to see the claims that they had to be hospitalized, they're usually going to be early on in the illness when they had a, a, a big decline in their ability to function and, and be able to, uh, to get through everything that they wanted to get through, okay? Um, next, um, uh, ARDS. Why do we care about this? Why do I want your attention on this one, right? Because in the claims, when you get to ARDS, right? When you get to that reaction uh, that's more severe, more involved, that's when you start seeing those long-term implications of lung volumes, right? That's when you can see some cognitive changes, psychiatric changes, muscular changes, right? So this is important because when I'm seeing these claims, right? What we're trying to say to them is, look, at about six months, you can often have resolution. Some of them can take years, but that's one of the things why I sometimes say, look, I need to reevaluate somebody in, in three months, six months, something like that, because sometimes these take time to clear out, right? Um, there are some later problems, right? Guillain-Barre, PTSD, the long COVID, right? You may have heard of that long COVID, long haulers, right? Um, those are all ones that can come up and I'm gonna show you, we're gonna talk about that when we get to claims, okay? Uh, next, testing, just a few little things about testing because everyone says I had a test. So I just wanna make sure that whenever you see somebody, whenever you see claims that I had a test, please make sure you're asking, which test did you have, right? Uh, PCR is the gold standard, right? And that's the antigen test that's looking for live virus, right? When we talk about where we take that from, in general, we're going to be taking that from the back of the nose. That's the most reliable test, right? When you talk about um, viral shedding, remember we talked about that before, about when the virus sheds, 20, 40, 40 hours before, and it can go up for 10 to 14 days easily, right? But remember, we talked about this, right? If you find the virus, it does not necessarily mean you're infectious, right? And so it's not necessarily that you're transmitting the infection. So keep that in mind when you see people. That's why there's so much attention that I'm asking to be putting towards when somebody had their test and what test they had done, right? And when you look at our literature, I know there's a busy slide, but I just want to highlight something, which is this is what happens when you're doing these kind of tests that you can see some false positive results depending on when you're doing tests. This is another way to look at it. Depends very much on what the patient has, right? Um, also, when you're talking about testing, the other test is blood tests, right? And so we know from the past SARS infection that the antibodies lasted at least two to three years, right? At least two to three years, the antibody lasts, right? So when people say, well, how long does the antibody last? Are you protecting up? We know that from past infections that they do tend to uh, hold up for a very long period of time. And there's been studies like this and also studies like this that showed that the antibodies are holding up over time, right? Uh, there's these lateral flow assays. Most people aren't doing that. What I recommend people do is the ELISA test. That's the blood test you wanna look for on the claims, right? Did they have an ELISA blood test? That's the blood test that's the most reliable and specific, right? And, and that allows you to go through an interpretation which is very much influenced 
by what's called the pretest probably, protest probably, a little bit more detail. I just want you to understand. But the other message I really want to give you, really, really important. This is very important again. Um, and and so if you understand the science, it's very important. So please stay with me on this. This is so important. I, I can't tell you, right? So here's the issue on the blood testing. Everybody's talking about antibodies, 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 okay? There are two ways that our body protects us, right? One way, when you get exposed to virus, the T cells start making other T cells, they make B cells, and they make antibodies, but they also make other cells, the effector, the memory cells, the killer G cells, and this is called cellular immunity, which is why you have people that said, I had the infection, you go to test their blood and they don't have antibodies, right? Because not everybody has their immunity through antibodies or they don't have a lot of antibodies, but they still can have immunity from the other mechanism, which is why you can have patients that had a lot of corona infections. Remember I talked to you before about the common colds, right? And so you say, well, these people with common colds, maybe they didn't have as much trouble. Okay, the reason is that they have some cellular immunity. By the way, there's been studies done that have looked at patients years and years later, they have cellular immunity from past infections. Now look at this, look, look, look. Here's, here's it's so important on the immunology, right? In the blood, this is a study done where they tested patients and they said, when you have very good testing done in the lab and controlled situations, 100% of the patients have antibodies, 100% of them had T cell responses, 100%, right? That goes along with every other viral infection, right? And that's what you expect, okay? Patients who never had exposure to COVID. Look at this. Look, look, look. Watch this. Watch this. This lab took blood from 2015, 2018, before COVID-19 ever existed. And 50% of them had T cells activity. You're saying, well, how's that possible, right? How is it possible that something didn't even exist? We have immunity. The answer, because there's a lot of overlap because of those common colds, right? So when you're thinking about testing, right? Just keep trying to keep this stuff in mind. When somebody gets exposed to the incubation period we've talked about, then the antibodies start going up and they start coming down. Symptoms, symptoms start going up and persist and come on down, right? So that's another way to look at it, right? Another way to look at it. Some people do better with graphs. That's why I have it both ways for you guys, both ways, both ways, right? Where immunity, right? When you're talking about usually seven to 10, this shows you what happens with the T cells, the B cells and the antibodies and how they all have that response, right? And so with the testing, I can guarantee a lot of things. Huge number of people have had it, right? Probably around 40, 45%, don't even know it. Um, and the current rate for fatality, this is very important, right? When everybody says there's people, like, yes, people have died. It's not a joke, right? But you have to understand the data. If you are under 70 years old, influenza is more likely to kill you than this condition, right? You have to be over age 65 to approach the level of mortality that you see with influenza. In the nursing home populations, yes, it's much worse, right? That's why 40 to 50% of all the deaths in the United States have been in the nursing homes, right? That's our vulnerable group, right? Those are the people you really have to think about, right? And so this gives you an idea of the mortality rates. Look at the mortality rate from heart disease, from cancer, all these other conditions. You are more likely to die from these other conditions than coronavirus. That's just the facts. That's the science, okay? All right, next. That's a rest stop, antibodies. All right, treatment. I just want to go through a couple of things because you're going to hear about this. You're going to see it on some of your claims. I just want to make sure you're aware of it, right? Um, there's some good overviews of treatment, but one thing is anti-inflammatories. No good evidence that anti-inflammatories are a problem. Um, and by the way, by the way, by the way, just in general for your general health, if you're on too much Tylenol um, and too much anti-inflammatories, this is generally true, right? If you're on too much of this stuff, it blunts your immune system. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. So I want you all to hear this, very important, okay? If you get sick, if you have a cold or a flu, if you're not feeling well, and you say, look, should I take some? Yes, if you're uncomfortable, take something. But try not to take the full doses. Try to go for Tylenol first, if it doesn't work, you can use an anti-inflammatory, but try to use the minimum amount possible. Why? Because we have a natural response that when we have a few, we're not feeling well. If you take high doses, it can blunt things. That's why treatment is so important to understand with this. Next, you're going to hear some stuff about, well, I heard people with high blood pressure are more at risk. And what about the blood pressure medicines they're on? Are they on it for work? Or are they on it, you know, all that kind of stuff. First of all, there's no good data. 
that the blood pressure medications make any difference. We already talked about sunlight, how important that was. Uh, you've heard the thing about the macrolides. They make no difference. You shouldn't do that. And there is good data about vitamin D, right? So if somebody says to you, look, I have a low vitamin D level. Should I be using that as part of the treatment or something like that? It's, it's totally reasonable to get people's vitamin D level up. That should be protective, okay? All right, that's a rest stop. Okay, here we go, impairment. Now we're going right to you guys. This is your central part uh, for you and your claims handling and everything you're looking at, okay? So I know I've thrown a lot at you. I know it's a lot of information, but I'm really trying to make you get it because if you're going to do workers' comp, if you're going to be in the medical field, you have to have the medical information. The more you understand the medicine, the more you understand the science, the more you're open to hearing things in a scientific basis, the better you'll be at understanding uh, what's going on in this claim and what's reasonable, right? So that's why I have to give you that background to try to help walk you through that science, right? And not to say, well, this is just about you know, your general health. It's talking about how you evaluate patients. If you don't like medicine, if you don't want to hear about it, mechanisms of injury or causation, return to work, you shouldn't be doing workers comp, right? Because this has medicine as its central feature. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So here are the questions that I think you should see should be asked on any of your intakes, right? These are the types of questions that I want you to be looking at and considering when you're looking at somebody about what's reasonable, what's an expectation, right? How are these questions being put to them, right? Other California specific, uh, specific questions. Don't forget about the presumptions, right? So there are criteria that were originally promulgated for the presumptions, right? So that's the first set of presumptions in California, right? About what things that you should be seeing on the presumptions. Next, SB 1159, they extended it for the presumptions to a future date. Look, they wanted it to be PCR positive. They can be diagnosed by a provider underneath a physician. Uh, you have to have a date of injury that is being the last day work. And you have to be diagnosed within 14 days of when your last work. Um, there are certain criteria. Uh, it's presumed in public safety, healthcare workers. It's presumed unless otherwise denied. And there's a definition of an outbreak, right? The outbreak is at work greater than five employees. And if you're four employees up to 100 or 4% thereafter, something like that. So what's truly an outbreak at your individual employers? Um, uh, that's something that I want you to keep in mind as to how you e e evaluate. By the way, by the way, by the way, in SB 1159, in general, work has to be an increased risk, right? So please keep that in mind, right? Work has to be an increased risk. So it's not just every, because I, I see these patients all the time now where they come and say, well, I got sick, right? So, you know, I, you know, first of all, I hear if I don't work, I get, you know, with the new thing, $1,400 a week. I don't even have to work. I, I don't think I should work in the first place, right? You know, and the second thing is then they say, okay, well now, you know, uh, in general work, you know, has to, you know, it's got to be that, but that's not true, right? It has to be something of a history that has some reasonable attribution to this so that you can understand, does this uh, presumption apply? Next, presumption, still SB 1159. The employer can rebut it if the employer shows they were doing things to try to do that. And also if there's evidence um, uh, about what is going to be a non-occupational risk, right? So those are the ways that this can be rebutted right? And it has to be considered when you're looking at these claims. So please keep that in mind because that's going to be another important piece, right? Next. And AB 685 uh, has some other distinctions, right? The employer has to know the employees in that area of an exposure and what's in that area is up to an employer, right? Obviously, small offices are a little different than the big factories, right? You have to notify and track cases reported. You have to know the employees of a workers' compensation option. And the California Department of Public Health by the way, has a slightly different standard. They consider an outbreak if anything greater than three cases in a work environment, right? So please keep that in mind, advise your clients about that, be thinking about those numbers, because uh, that's really important um, to be able to know uh, what are some of the distinctions and what are some of the areas that are there. Also, um, you want to take a look at the past medical history, right? Did you have any of the following conditions before you contracted the COVID-19 virus. Now, that's not to say that's not work-related. It's to say, you know, that this might explain why they're more susceptible. This might explain why they have a more severe outcome. This might explain when they're saying to you, well, you know, I don't think I was exposed to anybody else. 
but you can say, look, they were already at risk for this type of problem, right? So you can see how these scenarios start to come out of this, right? Um, uh, uh, so here we go. Here we go. So I'm just going to give you some, just to think through, just some scenarios to think through, and then we're, then we're almost there, right? So you got this scenario number one, an individual asymptomatic got testing for some reason. These people are usually at MMI within a few weeks of positive tests. There's no permanent impairment, right? Scenario number two, they're pre-symptomatic. They happen to be screened at some point, and the average illness, remember we talked about that, about you know two to five days later, you should know. And then do they go down one of the past the more troublesome ones? Okay, if they do, then they might have some uh, rating there to be considered. Scenario number three, right? These are individuals who test positive and they have mild disease. They're not hospitalized. They recovered home. They were never significantly dyspnea, right? Um, when they are back to normal activity, they can be declared an MMI. There are currently no case reports of mild disease, people recovered home, and yet have persisting symptoms suggesting permanent consequences. Now, if somebody comes into me, this happens all the time, and they were not severe. They say, oh, Mark, I'm still fatigued. I still feel sure about it. Okay, so one, I test them very carefully. Two, I will sometimes say, okay, look, let me check you back in three or six months, right? Because a lot of times that'll flush this out, right? So if you're looking at a claim, keep that in mind. Were they hospitalized? Were they at home? How much involved were they? And that would let you know what's reasonable. Get them checked out, let them be seen, let's evaluate it, but it might be worth saying, look, let's not make this permanent station right now. Let's look at this again in a number of months. Number four, okay? These are individuals, they have moderate disease. They're positive, they're hospitalized, right? They're not the ICU, they're not on the ventilator. Now these have some more serious illness, right? In these cases, you need the hospital records. Get the records because it's going to allow for objective documentation of what was involved with this person. Did they have some lung involvement on the CT scan, right? Did they? What did they show? What did their blood test show? What was their past history? Get their regular treating physician records. What did they have before all this? Okay, number five, right? Number five. Now you got severe disease, ICU, right? For sure, you're going to want pulmonary function testing, metabolic stress echo. These are the types of tests that you're going to need on these type of people. Again, are they at MMI PNS shortly after the hospital? Probably not, right? How long do you have to wait? Well, at least three, six months. You may wait a year to declare them at MMI, right? Give this time to heal. Give a tincture of time because people will improve over time. And that's something that you keep in mind when you look at this. Uh, last scenario, number six, um, this is all the worst. These are the people that were not only hospitalized, but they got into those complications we talked about. When we talked about the neurologic, psychologic, the heart stuff, right? These people get the records. These are the ones you're gonna have to wait months, sometimes years to see how they resolve over time, right? It's rare, these are very rare, but nonetheless, that's what you have to think about. Were they hospitalized? How severe were they? get the records, get their prior physician records, get them evaluated. And then at the same time, you know, keep in mind those timeframes I've talked to you about, right? As always, uh, make sure you have an activity day living questionnaire. This is the one that I wrote that's published in one of the AMA books. Uh, this has also been online, but I don't care which one you, you use or which one you look at, just make sure somebody's doing an ADL questionnaire in your reporting, right? Because that's going to be an important piece for you to know about and what they're talking about, okay? Testing should follow the AMA guides. These are the different tests that you could do. And there are places in the AMA guides. Now, because I speak nationally, I put some of the sixth edition stuff on there, but you can ignore that. We're a fifth edition state, but all these typical complications are in the AMA guides, right? So if they end up with a heart trouble, there's a way to rate it. Arrhythmias, there's a way to rate it. The cardiac muscle injury, there's a way to rate it. You know, pulmonary embolization, cardiac collision. Again, these things are very rare, but there are ways of rating this in the AMA guides, so you know what you're doing. If you get neurology, there's ways of doing that. ENT, remember people talk about the loss of smell. There's a way of rating that, right? Um, the hematology, right? The hypercoagulable states, there's a way of rating that. If they get the psychiatric, there's a way of doing that, right? Here's a study that looked at how long people are out of work, right? And so it gives you an idea of what kind of numbers you're looking at about people that were diagnosed with COVID and stuff, and you'll see 
that in the younger age groups, they may be off for a couple weeks, right? When you get to the older age groups, okay, then it tends to be a little bit more evolved, a little bit more severe, right? Um, uh, um, and then uh, and then there's ways of uh, looking at this uh, to surveil and, and predict that uh, in other countries too, just to let you look at that, right? So they have temporary working capacities, right? And 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 they have current situations of how they look at their people in different countries, right? So this has been described and worked out not just here, but in other countries, okay? Rest up. And then uh, we're just going to do a couple of things on the mass prevention, and then, then I'm open to your questions. I'll go through the chats for you and everything, right? But on the mass, we talked about these earlier. Um, and again, uh, in general, when you're wearing a mask, you're trying not to give an infection. You're, if you're wearing a high quality mask, trying to get infection. Uh, remember, we talked about copper. That's why there's a couple masks that have some copper in them based out of Israel. And those ones have uh, some advantages, theoretically, because they got copper in them, right? So if you're looking for, well, what's the best mask mark? Okay, get one with copper in it. You know, it'll probably be a little bit better for you, right? Um, next, if you wear a mask, you may get more asymptomatic disease. What does that mean? That when you wear a mask, it's possible that because you're wearing a mask, you get less of a viral load. You may decrease your chance of getting infection. Usually we talk about where you're just trying not to give it to people, but there's a chance, not strong, right? A surgical mask can de decrease the viral load to you uh, quite a bit. Not everybody's wearing surgical masks. And face shields can also help. By the way, by the way, there was a good study uh, done in China. Are you ready for this? Ready for this? It's very important. Um, the issue is, is that they showed that people who wore glasses were less likely to get infected, right? And that's just because you don't get propagation of the virus to the actual eyes, right? So face shields can have a little bit of a benefit, right? And so that's that's something to, to keep in mind also. But but keep in mind, the science on this is low quality. This is stuff, this is not just you know crazy stuff. This is the Annals of Internal Medicine, the entire national review published in October this year, not from years ago, right? Why? Why is it that there's a, you know, masks are not necessarily as great as ever makes you think, right? Multiple reasons. One, because masks, the data on masks were originally developed in medical settings, right? That's why back in March, when everybody was saying about masks, and you had Adams, the Surgeon General, and Fauci from NAD, and Robert Redfield from CC all saying, well, don't wear masks, right? Yeah, they were saying that because all the science said it probably didn't make a difference outside of an intensive medical setting, right? Of course, they all changed their mind because people feel they got to do something and say something. But that the science, the science is, is that this is a problem with the mask. A lot of people, you'll notice, they put a mask on, then they're adjusting all the time with their hands. It's not really fit around their face. And then they're using it, putting it down, putting it up and stuff. So that's why sometimes these masks don't live up to what people think that they should do or how they could work, right? Um, and that's why there's uh, there was no change in that, right? There's different efficacies. But here's here's something I think is very helpful, right? Just look at this. Look at this. this is from the medical literature, right? So what's the risk of where you are and what type of protection do you need? So if you're working alone, or you're walking outside, you don't need a mask, right? As you start to go into an urban area, okay? Well, maybe a retail store, okay. Now you're telling me, maybe, maybe you can have a walk, okay. So what I say to my patients all the time, look, you know, if you're going into a store, there's other people there, wear a mask, right? Does, does it, do I have good science behind it? No. Do I think it's reasonable? Yeah, I think it's okay. Right. Um, but the science is just not great. Right. Um, but but if it's going to be a store, a lot of people or it's a smaller store, it doesn't have good ventilation. Right. But we start to get those subways. Right. Well, we know from New York, look what happens on crowded subways. Right. OK, now now you're starting to get to situations where there can be more of an argument for masking. Right. And then certainly you get to the medical world, our world. This is where the data comes from. This is where the data says, yes, in these types of scenarios, there is good use of these masks and they should be used, right? And so another way to look at this is what's your job? What is the job and what's reasonable for that job, right? So you can see as you get into work activities which are high occupancy, poorly ventilated, then the need for the masks go up. But if you're outdoors, well ventilated, right? Those kind of things. And this is the type of activities you're looking at then the mask probably doesn't make a big difference, right? So that's that's one of the ways to kind of think about it, right? And so this is um, uh, this is a sneeze. So take a look at this, right? Got it? So this is with a face shield, right? And you can see what happens when you have face shields 
and what happens to the aerosol over time, right? And how it can stay around and what kind of protection it may or may not give you, right? So some people find, find that these are very helpful to them. Okay, um, and uh, I have to just do this real quick because I knew someone was gonna ask me, so I just thought I'd do this for you. Um, okay, here we go, uh, vaccines. All right, so look, everybody's talking about the vaccines right now. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff about, you know, safety and all that kind of stuff. Um, I do uh, recommend uh, everybody get vaccines. Um, there's a couple groups in some of my patients where you have a different discussion. Um, the one I'm safe to talk about with all of you right now is to talk about you know, kids under 16. Uh, right now, I would not give a vaccine to. Um, we could have a discussion about other vaccines, uh, but uh, but that's that's kind of a thing. Uh, but otherwise, in general, I'm very supportive of the of vaccines um, and 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 something that I think uh, everybody should be doing. Um, and the vaccines it should work on most of the variants. The one in South Africa might be a little bit weaker, but still the crossover looks pretty good. Those are the different ones. As you know, we have two different ones right now: Pfizer, and Moderna. Uh, Johnson Johnson, AstraZeneca will be coming out. And by the way, by the way, by the way, very important, very important. Um, the Johnson Johnson AstraZeneca, the advantage is they do not require the same negative cold chain storage. So you should be able to distribute those to regular doctor's offices if they will or not. Who knows? The government controls all this stuff. Um, and uh, But that would be advantage. And the Johnson Johnson product advantage um, is it's only one shot. AstraZeneca is two shots. Uh, but they're also done by the older technology, not the new RNA mRNA technology, which some people have some concerns about. Uh, air travel in general, just real quickly, for if you have claims of people who travel on the air and they're saying, well, because for work I had to travel and stuff like that. Okay, yes, it does increase your risk um, because you're just going through a lot of stuff, but probably, probably for the, for the sake of this discussion, just so you've heard the signs, um, as of October, there are probably 40 cases that seem to be air-related air travel uh, cases out of thousands and thousands to hundreds of thousands now approaching millions of people traveling on the airplanes. So in general, when uh, people say they travel for work or travel for personal, in general, I tell everybody that I think it is relatively a safe environment. Okay, here's the summary, and then I'm gonna go to your questions, right? So diets of weight loss important. We saw about the obesity risk, right? Uh, see your doctor regularly. I can't think of a better time in your life to have a relationship with your regular family doctor to help you navigate all this information, right? Get a flu shot every fall. If you tell me you don't get flu shots, but you're gonna get this shot, you you make no sense to me at all, right? Uh, we've talked about who should get a vaccine. We talked about that range of options um, and, and stuff. As always with everything we do, uh, prayer is very important. Um, so uh, that's it. Okay, so I'm gonna take your question.